the gardens are kicking. Everything's starting to come in. We're starting to eat out of the garden like we're supposed to. And I love cucumbers. And I got a Calypso. I planted me some Calypso cucumbers, pickles, mm -hmm. pickles. And they're coming along real good. And they about, it's about the size they are. Now, they're really productive. And this is one of my favorite pickling varieties to grow. All female flowers. All female flowers and loaded up with blooms. I was out there earlier this afternoon and the bees was working the blooms. I mean, they were just tearing it up. Blooms everywhere. So I got a good crop of these. Now, here is something new I've grown this year, never grown before, and I ate me a belly full of them last night. Uh-oh. I like them. You like them? Lemon cucumber. Mm-hmm. Tastes like a lemon? Does it look like nope. a lemon? Nope. Nope. Looks kind of like a lemon, but don't taste, taste like cucumber. Okay. Yep. Very good. We're going to slice it up and may partake in a little bit. I'll let you a taste test of it. Okay. Let's say hey to everybody right. first. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Row by Row Garden Show. We're excited to have you with us tonight. I'm Travis. I'm Greg. And we've got a really good show planned. We're going to talk a little bit later about organic or kind of all-natural pest control solutions for your garden. It's getting that time of year. When, yeah, I when, noticed bug, I noticed some bugs in mine, so, so I've been on it. We're going to kind of cover, try to cover the full gamut of that. But before we get to that, we're going to keep talking about these cucumbers here. So these, uh, the gynoecious cucumbers that mm -hmm. make all the female flowers, what they do is the seed companies, they put what they call a pollinizer in there. So they try to match it up something similar. So they'll every, and I don't know what the ratio is, but let's just say every 15 seeds, they'll put something like an OP national pickling in there. Cause you got to have a male flower, a couple of them in the- uh, in So the that's road. the reason in the seed pack, the seeds are different colors in there. You know that? No, I haven't noticed that. Yeah, so evidently the male flower, the male plant is a different seed color because you'll, about every 15 to 20 seeds, there's a different color seed in there. Okay, that's probably what that is. So they use, I know for the uh, the stone wall, they use something like the uh, market more as the pollinizer. And it's they just use some kind of OP variety uh, just so you get, you need just one or two male flowers, the rest of them female. And that's how that works. Hmm. Pollinizer. Pollinizer. Okay. Now, I don't know about you, but my favorite seasoning on cucumbers is cavenders. Oh, yeah? Yep. Not good? Yep. That's pretty good. That is good. That's what I ate for lunch yesterday right there. I like to put them in a bowl with some balsamic vinegar. I do that oil. too. Now this right here is going to catch you a little different. I want you to look at the inside of that right there. There's a lot more white flesh in there. And what I found these last night would be a lot more juicier than that one right there, than that regular Eclipso is. So I'm going to let you take that one right there. Do we need to put some cabinets yes, on we this do. one too? Yes, we do. And I'm going to let you, let you see what's so different about them. Well, and rub that in yeah, they, they're a lot more juicy and more fleshy to it. It's a, it's a little different. Now, I didn't find a lot of difference in the flavor, although there is some. Seem like a little more tender. A little more tender. They are more tender. A lot more tender. So, this is the thing. I'm going to plant me a whole row of these probably in the next couple of days. What, the lemons? I, I, I really like them. I do. So, we got both of these on the side. The lemon cucumber, which is um, kind of like an heirloom OP. Uh, cucumber and then the calypso which you've done chunk bit into yeah. uh, this is the really productive one that makes all the female flowers and if you want slicers slicers we got a stone wall I got some of those that are just starting to bloom now um, we'll have some of those not too long at yeah all. I would highly recommend that lemon it's a good one man that's good did you trellis those or you I did not they don't, they're not a real big vining plant you could trellis them, but I just go more. They don't make, they're, they're like the clips are, they don't make a lot of vine. They just load you. it with blooms. I got you. So I, I don't think uh, growing them on a trellis would be the way to go. I got you. Well, I want to show you some of these. And so these right here, along with Lacinato kale, these are what I call champions of the garden. One of the most productive things you can grow. Now, you don't know, you, I know you don't know a whole lot about this because you can't grow collards like I can grow collards. Um, but 
I've done picked these four times. I planted them, I can't remember when I planted them, but early spring. I'm on my fourth picking of these. I've been picking them every week. I got about a 60 foot long double row and I'll pick about half the row at a time. And man, they are just keep producing and producing. I got a few little nibbles being taken out of the leaves, but for the most part, I've been able to keep, keep them under control. And this is the tiger variety. Mm -hmm. And if some, now don't tell me if you haven't grown the tiger. But if somebody has grown side by side another variety that was better than the tiger, I would sure like to hear about it because yep. I'll be glad to add it to our seed lineup. Yep. But That's I have good. yet to find one that in my dirt and at my house that produces better than this tiger here. Now it breaks my heart when I go to the grocery store and I see somebody selling bunches of collards that they done cut off at the base. And I know some people That's like That's the way we used to do it though. We didn't know no better. Some people like to harvest them that way, but you can get I have spent many a day harvesting them that way. You can get I would say eight or ten harvests on some of them. If you mm -hmm. get it time it just right early spring, these things don't bolt that bad at all. Just keep and keep and keep harvesting them. And I do love collars and I love kale. I got some some less snotto kale in the garden now. However, when my cucumbers and my squash and my onions and my potatoes start coming in, I find myself letting that stuff go by the wayside and I eat that. I just concentrate on that. I want to gorge myself out on them. I got you. And I'm in the middle of my gorging stage right now. I've been eating squash every night. You need night. to figure out how to incorporate those. Yeah. With I, I know, but I, want, I like to eat my greens in cold weather for some reason or other when it's cold weather. Springtime, when it's this time of year, I just I want to gorge myself on cucumber, squash, onions, taters. Man. Yeah. Yeah. So I started to tell you to, to bring your to some. bring your biggest onion, but then I didn't want to hurt your feelings. I could have matched you on that one. Uh now this one ain't quite as big as the one them folks from Florida grew, no. but it's close. So this was my biggest one I had, and that's that's a little bit bigger than a softball. Now all mine ain't this size. Most of mine on average are between a baseball and a softball. Yeah. Um but I just want to show you all that. I was proud of that one right and there. And you should be. You did okay. I got all my, on my storage rack, all my Texas ladies, I had just enough room to fit them all there on one shelf. I got my red ones. They were a little bit behind. I got them laying on the grass. They're drying out. I'll probably put them on the storage rack. And you never got you a storage rack. Never did. But I, placed, I gathered my onions a couple of days ago, put them in my barn like I, like I always have. On some straw, and uh, I'm gonna have to build me a storage rack. I I got scolded again just yesterday about that. Yeah, you better tighten up. Yep. You better tighten up. And then before we get into the pest control stuff, I just wanted to mention a couple things here. Hey, right, so let's 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 hold that one down for a second. Okay. Let's talk about this one. So we we mentioned last week we got this uh, on the site. This is our new product called Micro Boost. And we've been selling quite a bit of it. We have this in the gallon, which is what you see here, and we have it in a quart. Yep. The suggested rate on this is a quarter cup per thousand square foot. So a gallon this would go pretty long ways. Yep. Um, you can't overdose with it though. Like fertilizer where you can't burn, you, you're not hardly burn with that if you do mess up. Right. It's a real safe product. So you can use this by itself or you can use it as uh, in combination with your normal what I call NPK fertilizer. So mix it with your 20, 20, 20, uh, or any, any other kind of fertilizer you like, you can mix it. It works really well in the injector. Um, we can also use it banding with the pump sprayer like you've shown before. And you can foliar spray with it. You can foliar spray with it. Well, you could even probably use it as a soil drench pre-plant yep. if you wanted to. Yep. So this contains, we know about the major macronutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, this contains a lot of the micronutrients that are extremely essential, but needed in only small quantities. Also, some of the fulvic acids. This got some seedweed extract into it. Right. It's a wonderful product. It's got a lot of different stuff in there, and it kind of rounds out the balance of your fertility program. So without getting too scientific, it's got magnesium, sulfur, copper, boron, iron, manganese, molybdenum, and zinc. And a lot of these things are important in chlorophyll formation, enzyme formation, 
amino acids, sugar transport, a lot of that molecular level stuff that's really important for the plant. So uh, we, we used this for a whole year before we decided to bring it on and it's really good stuff and we think you'll like it. So give that a try, add some of it. It works wonders on beets. I've been using a lot on beets. Beets need a little extra boron. It's a good way to get it to them. I credit that right there with how green my garden is right now. My corn, my tomatoes, of course, we've got a video coming out. But all that is just as green as it could be. And I credit to this product right here. It's good stuff. All right, and then show them what you've got there. What I got right here is a new product we just got in this week. And that's on the website, too. So if you look under fertilizers, we have our own OMRI certified organic uh, fish emulsion fertilizer. And we call it Liquifish. Yep. That's a two, three, one. And fish emulsion is great to keep from adding too many salts to your garden, getting some organic material in there. And the, the breakdown of the fish emulsion, although it takes longer than a conventional fertilizer, yep. is going to increase your microbial exactly. biological life. Exactly. That's what I was going to say. This is actually going to feed your soil. Mm -hmm. Not only is it going to feed the plant, but it's going to feed the soil. Now, the fish emulsions work wonderful in hot weather like we're having right now in summertime. They're a little slower in the wintertime, but this is the time of the year to put these fish emulsions out there. and You can get a pretty fast exchange and breakdown of them get the microbes pumping in your soil and get those nutrients to your plant. This is a, uh, it has some insoluble, but it's mostly soluble nitrogen, so it's gonna get there fairly quick. And you can put this through the fertilizer injector as well. Um, it's, it's fine enough for you Complete can- Complete natural product. And th this one is what we call hydrolyzed. So there's two different ways they make fish emulsion. They can do it with heat or without heat. This is hydrolyzed, which means they don't use a lot of heat to break it down which means it preserves a lot of the natural proteins and enzymes, which are gonna be great for your soil. Got it in gallons and quarts. Gallons and quarts, so check that out. And then, now into our main, main meat of the show here. I'm gonna keep, be partaking in this right here while you get it. Actually, one more thing before we get okay. into there. So, I wanted to share this. So I purchased this on Amazon the other day. This is a textbook. It's kind of getting me back to my Your roots. academic days. And uh, I kind of want to dig in. And as we're educating customers and making videos, I want to be more educated myself. So I bought this book here called Soil and Water Chemistry. Now, this this isn't going to read like your Dr. Seuss book. It's pretty, it's pretty heavy. It's pretty thick in there. So it's going to take me a while to break through it. But I'll, I'll be glad to, to share some of the stuff we learned uh, from digging through this, but I'm really excited. That's going to be my summer reading project to really understand soil and water chemistry a little better. I'll decipher it for you if you get bogged down in it. Would you like to? No, I'm good. Thank you. Would you like to uh, give us my a learning, lesson? No, my learning days is about over with. I've already, yes. I've, I've already learned about all I can handle right now. You full up there? I'm pretty full up here. <coughs> all right. Okay. So, as we mentioned, it's getting warmer out there. Our pests are gonna start coming out if they hadn't already. So we wanna be able to take care of these pests. We can't always expect full eradication because that's just not possible. Control is the key word there. Control, we wanna limit the number of reproductively mature adults in the population. That's really what we're trying to do. To minimize damage. Right, we're not gonna get rid of them completely. We're not ever gonna have no damage um, and if you had a problem with a particular pest last year, you almost guarantee you're going to have a problem with it this year. So being proactive uh, instead of reactive is, is the key here to minimizing the damage and saving your crops. And also, one thing before we get into this is sometimes you have to realize there's just certain parts of the year when you just shouldn't be trying to grow certain things. Or I, growing certain things in certain times of the year. Right, so I'm not gonna try to grow any kind of squash in September. Squash bug pressure is just off the charts. Um, so you win some times of the year, you, you let them have it the other times of the year. All right, so we wanna get into, kinda of in, talk about the insecticides we carry, um, some of the things to control worms and caterpillars. If we have time, get into some fungicides and then talk about kind of how you set up a program for yourself based on 
what your garden needs. Everybody's program may be a little different depending on their pressure and what they have to do. Before with. we dig into that, let me just let me <coughs> here. plants are just like human beings. So we just got through talking about some nutrition for the plant. You need that plant growing, you need plenty of nutrition for that plant and that plant to be healthy. And it fights off insect disease pressure when it's healthy. When you have plants are just like human beings. When we're, our immune system gets down, we're prone to more problems. And plants are the same way. When they're unhealthy through a nutrition, they are more prone to disease and insect pressure. So the first part of an insect disease program is having that plant healthy and having all the nutrients available to it. And then we kind of move into the the disease and insect control. That was good, wasn't it? That was good. Yep. That was good. So all of this and, and kind of our strategy with our pest control and our personal gardens, we like to use what we call kind of an integrated pest management program. And before we brought on this entire line of products, there's a, I'm not even going to try to say his name, but there's a professor in Auburn that's pretty sharp. And that's done a lot of, uh, if you've ever ordered our Garden Pest Success Kit, there's a little chart he made. Yeah, he's a good guy, a good friend of ours, yeah. Um, just call him Dr. A. Dr. A is what they call him, and that's what I'm going to call him, Dr. A. But he's he runs the circuit, some of the small farm trade shows and seminars and things like that, and he's done a lot of research. And uh, when we talk from time to time, and, and he gives us some input of what we need to do different or what's what's working and what's new out there. He does a lot of testing also with organic products. Right. And so um, he, he's provided some good advice to us over the years and how to, which products we should be carrying, what is best for certain pests, stuff like that. All right, so let's dig into the insecticides first. And first we're gonna start, talk about the things that kind of control more of what I'll call more like flying or crawling insects. Um, not things in the larval stage, but maybe in the nymph stage. Yep. All right, so what about squash bugs? Squash bugs would be one of those things, you know, you got yep. you want to get them when they're in that nymph stage. Once they get in the adult stage, they're hard to kill. So we was in the garden yesterday, and we noticed a bunch of eggs underneath some of my, some of my winter squash, some of our pumpkins that were growing. We noticed a lot of eggs underneath there. So a squash bug normally stays in that nymph stage about six weeks. Uh -huh. So from the, when it hatches out to the egg till it gets to the adult, that six weeks period there is your ideal time to control it. Because it's really hard to control in the egg stage and it's really, if not impossible, to control when he's in the adult stage. So you got to get him in that nymph stage when he's susceptible to these, to these products. You got to hit him hard. The key there with any of these products is timing coverage frequency and coverage yeah now since you had eggs that means you already got some adults here right and i i like to uh if i see them i'll squish them right just try to get rid of those. so let's start working through some of these products so we'll start off with our first one uh which is nemo which is probably the most popular uh organic mm -hmm. insecticide out there derived from the neem tree which is over in india they have a lot of those um You'll also see some products called Azure, or which has the active ingredient Azure Direct, and pretty much the same thing. Um, neem is going to work great on larval uh, or nymph. nymph insects. It's not going to do much on adults. Um, adults are pretty much kind of impervious to it, so that's why you want to treat early and um, get them while they're in that nymph or immature Yeah, you know, neem oil is a great product, even the conventional farmers. They use a lot of neem oil in their uh, in their rotation, and the reason they use neem oil is, is because of resistance. Mm -hmm. So they, you know, this is although it's an organic product, it's used in a lot of conventional farming because this great attribute of insects do not become resistant to it. Right. So neem oil there, and then we'll, we'll show we have some combination products later that have neem oil in them as well. And then the second one we're going to talk about. Let's talk about pyrethrin. Real quick. So pyrethrin is derived from the chrysanthemum plant. Of a type of chrysanthemum plant. Mm -hmm. Not the actual marigolds that we plant in the garden or go to the garden center or the big box store and buy. It's a different strain of the chrysanthemum plant. But it's naturally derived. It is compound. naturally derived. And in South Africa, I think, is where they grow most of this product and most of this, this is produced at. Now, years ago, 
scientists took the pyrethrin, and that's what this is, is the pyrethrin, and they synthesized the product, and they come up with a line of chemistry called pyrethroids. Uh -huh. And that is a compound that is synthesized from the pyrethrin. Now, that is a synthetic product that is not... Uh, that is used a lot in agriculture, but is not a natural product. But it's based from this right here. So this is a contact spray. So this is a contact. Kill whatever it hits, so you want to spray this late in the evening, and it uh, it works by affecting the insects. And it has canola oil in there that really helps with the the, <coughs> the coverage of it and uh, as a carrier. And um, grab that bug buster real quick, and keep keep the take down too. So a lot of people ask what the difference between these two is, and it's pretty simple. Uh, this one has canola oil in it and it's not organically sourced, so that's why this product is not Omni registered. It is a natural product, but it's not Omni registered. Right. The Bug Buster here has the same active ingredient. It doesn't have the canola oil, so this is Omni registered. This is going to be the same. You might have seen a product out there called Piganic. Bug Buster, same thing as Piganic. Yeah. The thing about the Piganic is, which is a great product, I don't know that you can buy the Piganic in this type, in the uh, pints. And that's right. the reason we get this right here, because it is available in the pints. Right. It's a little bit of a pricey product, but it is a good one. Yeah. And you can mix you can mix any of these together yep. and make you a cocktail. We'll talk a little bit about that You threw later. that one? Yeah, we're through with that one. Let's go to the Hort Oil real quick. Hort Oil. So oil. I use the horticultural oil, and they and even commercial guys use this oh, a yeah. lot. Oh. I use this a lot in the cooler weather gardens to control some of those smaller things. You like can age. get some burn. In these hot days, you don't want to spray any of these, but especially this one on a hot day in the middle of the day because you can get some burn. But for uh, cool weather crops, greens and stuff that you don't want anything really eating on them, the hort oil is a good choice. Let me tell you something else about the hort oil. If okay. you got fruit trees such as peach trees, plum trees, pear trees, any of those type trees, you want to spray this horticulture oil on that bark and crevices. You want to soak that whole tree down good before bud break. And this helps a lot with those insects that control, that attack fruit trees. This is the premier product to use on those any of the fruit trees before bed break. Right, and whether it's on a tree or on a leafy uh, vegetable, what it does is it provides a kind of a coating over the vegetation that interferes with any feeding that can happen. On and it leaves. will also suffocate in the nymph and the crawler stages. We have a lot of trouble with scale on fruit trees and things like that. And this product will actually suffocate those, those crawlers or those nymphs. Right. And bust a cycle. And then the last one we have here, which is kind of a boom boom combination of several. Now this is called Fruit Tree Spray Plus, and I don't really like that name, but it's a good name. It's we didn't a, come up. With we the didn't name. come up with it. It's a great product to spray in, in the garden. garden as well. So this it's one of my favorites. Now I'll tell you the reason why it's got pyrethrin plus neem oil. Right. So, so a lot of times we'll mix the takedown, which is pyrethrin, and the neem oil, or the bug buster and the neem oil. You get both in one package right here. And they have what they call synergistic. Synergistic, I think was the word you were looking for there. What does it mean? You'll do it one more time? Synergistic. Effect yeah. off of that. So they work together and they enhance one another. And we should mention all of these are not uh, what we call RTU. You're getting more for your money here. RTU would be ready to use. Right. All these are concentrates. All these are concentrates. And most of these, you're only mixing one to two ounces a gallon. So you're going to get several spray-ins out of even a little The reason we do that is to give you more value. Right. All right. So those were the things that it controls kind of the nymphs, the crawling, the things that can become flying soft insects. Soft-body insects. Any of the soft-body insects, they will control. Right. Aphids, thrips, any of those, even in the adult stage, if you get coverage on them. Beetles, when they're in the nymph stage. Yeah, when the nymph stage, stage, not in the adult stage. Your, your soft body insects, as I mentioned, aphids, thrips, there's probably some more out there, scales, any of the soft body scales, these products will control in the adult stage. All right, let's talk about the worms. Now, with squash and cucumbers and tomatoes, Seems like a lot of people have problems with the worms. Corn. Yep. Um, so if you ever get the worms climbing in your cucumbers, those are pickle worms. You want to make sure you get those early. Once they get inside the fruit, you don't have a way to spray them. So if you can get them early, it's the way to go. So the first one we got, and this is about as popular as Nemo, is the BT, which is a 
uh, what we call bio uh, insecticide. It's a naturally occurring bacteria. And what it does is once you put it on the plant, it um, creates this, what they call a cry toxin or CRY toxin. And then once the animal or insect or worm ingests it, it kills them. It busts the cycle. Right. Now this is another one that the conventional guys use a lot of, and the reason be is the same thing. It really helps with their resistance that they're having with conventional pesticides. This is Omni labeled. It's an organic pesticide, but it's used extensively in the uh, in the conventional farming. If you got worms eating on your broccoli, your collards, stuff like that, this is going to be the product to go to. Now you need to understand this is a preventive type deal. It really works better before you have that problem. You got to anticipate and you got to have a spray program and have this end of that spray program before you get a big infestation of those worms and you start getting damage. Right. So uh, if you know you're going to have worm pressure, go ahead and be applying that before you even see any worms. Then we have kind of stepping it up a notch. Does some of the things, same things the BT does, but a little more powerful. Spinosad. Spinosad. So spinosad is probably one of the most... Uh, I would say the most powerful organic insecticides you can use. It's naturally brewed, naturally fermented product. Mm -hmm. It's got a fairly wide range of things it can take care of. It can do the take care of the worms and caterpillars, but also some of those soft-bodied insects mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. um, Has two different modes of action, if I'm not if I'm not right, mistaken. Right, so it kills on contact and by ingestion, kind of like the BT does. It's a neurotoxin. And then the last one we have here, you want to get the sluggo. This sluggo is in is spinosad as well, but it's not in a liquid form. It's a granular form, and this is a bait. So if you have a lot of problems with slugs and snails and stuff like that, this is a bait you can put out your garden. Once they ingest the bait. Uh, yeah, I believe it's iron them. phosphate. Yes, iron phosphate is they're attracted in there. So the slugs eat this, and then they die. It's not by contact. Simply a bait. Right, right. All right, so those were our things to kill the worms. That covers our kind of insecticides. Mm -hmm. And um, so I usually, when I spray, and we'll talk about a program here in a minute, I like to include, I like to mix one something that kills the worms like BT with something that kills the soft bodies like either Nemo or Takedown. Uh, mix those together that way I get a broad coverage. Yeah, I do too. Well, either I'll rotate. <coughs> Sometimes I, I have been known just spray a BT and a couple of days later spray a, a, a neem or either a spinosad. I'm really good about scouting. I've been in doing pest control for a long time, so I'm pretty good about scouting and getting an idea of where my pressure's at so I can do that. The average person probably needs, would probably do something like what you're doing. Right, yeah. yeah. You say I'm more advanced. You're more advanced, to. okay. Um, Let's get into the fungicides real quick because that's a part of our okay. uh, program as well. I'm about to run out of cucumber there. So we've got a couple different options here. We've got an organic option. This is what we call our complete disease control. And this is a naturally occurring bacteria. This one is called Bacillus and even I'll butcher this name, Amyloleak fascians. Sounds good to which me. This is a long one. Now, this is very similar to what you see in stores called Serenade, mm -hmm. which is another naturally occurring bacteria. It's actually Bacillus subtilis. This is just another species, but works just the same as Serenade does. Is a naturally occurring bacteria that can control a lot of fungal problems for you. Yeah, this can be used two different ways. This can be used as a soil drench on early transplants for soil diseases because what happens here is when you use it as a soil drench, it colonizes on the root system of the plant. Mm -hmm. And this can help a lot with your pyro, uh, not pyrethrin, your, uh, pythium. your pythium and your rhizoc. Mm -hmm. So any of those soil diseases, this is a great product when used as a soil drench. However, you can also do a foliar spray with this and it works as a protective. When I say it works as a protective, it covers that plant. And again, coverage is really important. It covers that plant and it keeps those disease pores from penetrating that leaf, causing the problem. So it has two different modes of action there. I used it as a soil drench on my watermelons and stuff this time. And it worked great for that. I think I may have lost two plants out of all of them. Uh, tomatoes, I would highly recommend using it on tomatoes as a soil drench when you transplant. 
Yeah, if you, you have problems with blight and tomatoes, it's a great natural organic product to use for that. And then the kind of conventional solution uh, we have for fungal control and stuff is this stuff right here called liquid. Yeah, and I'm going to quote Wendell, the, this uh, Monterey rep, and he says this right here. Liquid cop is as close to a natural product as you can get without it being completely natural. Right, right. Um, so no big worry about putting this on your garden. I, I've been using this for a couple of years now. It, it's really comprehensive in what it can cover. You know, powdery mildew, downy mildew, blight, anthracnose. Leaf spots. Yeah. Uh, circus spore, all kind of different stuff. It's all in area. Great, great product. Um, and and you can use it, you can use it once you see a problem. But I like to use it preventively. I know on my potatoes, once it gets hot, I'm subject to have some problems. So I'm going to spray it early on those. Works really well on all the nightshade family. It does. It does. And then the last one we got here is the good old fashioned bicarb. Yep. Now this one's forte is powdery and downy mildew. This is what this one does so great on more powder than it is downy. But if you got some squash or things like that that you normally have problems with pumpkins, pumpkins is an ideal crop there that you normally gonna have problems with some powdery mildew. This is the one to use. It's a protected that you spray on there. It's a real safe product. Yeah, so this is dissolve that in with your yep. other stuff. And uh, I know we're not big rose growers, but if you got roses, I thought roses are bad to get powdery mildew. This is a great product to spray on roses or any of your annuals or flowers, anything like that. All right, so like we mentioned, we can mix all these together based on what pests we need to target. So let's, uh, we want to kind of give an example and talk about your tomato spraying program okay. that you're currently on. And this is a, basically what it is, is it's a three week rinse and repeat program. So you kind of do, you're doing something different week one, two, and three, and then you're just starting all over and repeating it. Tomatoes to me is a high value crop in the garden. I put probably more energy in my tomato grow ones than I do anything else. They're, they take a lot of tender love and care. I love tomatoes and I really want to grow a good tomato plant. I have to stake them, I have to baby them along. So therefore it's really important to me that I control the pest onto my tomatoes and that's the reason I came up with this program right here. Okay, so let's start off week one. What are you, uh, what are you putting on? Neem oil and complete disease control. So week one, we're gonna mix these two products together. Yep. And uh, we're gonna get some really good coverage. We're gonna spray this late in the evening. This stuff right here can start to degrade with a lot of UV exposure. So we're gonna spray it late in the evening and get some good coverage on the plant. Right. Next week, the following week, we're gonna spray fruit tree spray and liquid cop. So we got a pyrethrin, we still got some more neem in there, and then we've got the liquid cop fungicide. Same thing, spray late in the afternoon or early in the morning. Let me tell you something about this right here. You want to use a measuring cup. Don't do like my granddaddy used to do and just pour in there and you think you got enough. You can get some burn with some of this stuff if you don't use the right amount. You want to make sure you read the label. And we got the ratios on our website. It's real easy to find what, how much you're supposed to use. Most of it's a teaspoon or a tablespoon or an ounce per gallon. We get you, if you ain't got it, we got measuring cups. Put you a measuring cup close to your garden, measure it out and use the right amount because it's important that you don't overuse this stuff. Especially when it's liquid coffee, you want to use the right amount there or you can get some damage. All right, so that's week two. Yep. And then week three, we're going to go with the garden in spinosad garden insect spray. Not that one. I can't half see. I ain't got my glasses. It's over there behind the VT, I think. No. There you go, right there. And the, the complete disease control again. Okay, and then so week three, we're going to go back to this. We're basically alternating our fungicides. One week copper, one week this, just to keep it mixed up so we don't get a lot of resistance. And then the third week, the insecticide we're going to use is this spinosad here. Yep. And then so after that, we will go back and do the same thing we did week one, and we'll just do that 
every week throughout the entire life of our tomatoes. Pick you one day out of the week that's going to be your spray day. Keep that rotation going. It also will work great on peppers, eggplants, anything in your nightshade family. Now, I don't use that on my potatoes, but I do use it on my peppers and my tomatoes, eggplants, things like that. So, lots of products there uh, for all different kind of pest pressures and stuff. Uh, it's good to mix them together. I wouldn't take the same one and spray it every week because you could get some resistance there and you're going to lose some Resistance is not going to be a, 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 a biggest issue is mode of action. You want to change it by that mode of action so you're attacking them differently. Right, right. So get the ones that, that work for you, mix them together, spray them late in the evenings, and have a regular program. And measure your amount you're going to spray. Yeah. All right. If you have any more questions about particular pests or anything like that, put those in the comments. And we'll be glad to get to them. We've got a few questions from last week's show. Okay. And as always, if we answer your question on the show, send us an email to cussserve at hostels.com. We'll be glad to send you a nice little prize. So what, what, you want to read the first question there? Well, the first question, let me doctor this up. The first question is, comes from old Nightlight Z. Nightlight Z. <laughs> Says, Greg, Travis, are y'all brothers? Well, we are related, but we're not brothers. Um, it's kind of complicated, and I'll try to explain it. I got it written down here so, so we can kind of explain it. My great aunt, Eleanor was married to a feller named Edward. Edward was a train conductor and uh, run coal around here. Well, Eleanor, while Edward was out on a train run, she was running around on Edward. On Edward, poor Edward. And she left him for a feller named Leo. Well, Edward then, after Eleanor left him for Leo, Edward remarried a lady named Esther who was Greg's third cousin twice removed. And so what does that make us? Eight cousins. Eight cousins. So you can do the math there uh, if you can figure that out. But that we are related just a really long ways off. There is 20 years and 15 days between us. Right. Yep. You can, take, you can figure that one out on your own. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, our second question there is from um, Dolly Perry. Actually, it's 20 years and 20 days. Yes, it is. Excuse me. It is. Our second question here from Dolly Perry. She says, how do we decide what to carry in the way of seeds? Uh, and then she says she wants more info on succession planting and about vertical growing, stuff like that. So how do we decide what seed varieties to carry? Well, you know, the vertical growing thing is kind of interesting to me. And I, we always like to try something new. And we got, just like this lemon cucumber we got this year, it's always interesting to try something new there. So we got some new things growing. And she's talking about this vertical thing, which we do some of. Rattlesnake pole beans, you can do some of your cucumbers that way. We got some uh, butter beans back there that can grow vertical. Uh, so those are all things that we really like to incorporate in our garden because they save space. And we look around and see the things that we think we can grow that we have experience with and we bring them as a seed and we're bringing on a lot more. Right. So we, we like to have a lot of the classical, popular, open pollinated stuff. But we also have, because we're in an agricultural hotbed here, we also have uh, access to some really knowledgeable people in the seed industry who can tell us what some of these commercial guys are growing. We can get some versions of that that the home gardener could use to experience some really high productivity in their gardens. Yeah, a prime example of that is, like I said, there's cucumber varieties that we got, tomato varieties that we got, zinnia varieties that we got, sunflower varieties that we got. We got experience with all of those, and we know they're proven things that are really productive, more so than you can get at your average home garden seed place, and that's kind of our forte. Yeah, our specialty is have these productive disease resistant varieties are going to make it easy for you to grow your own food and these are varieties a lot of times you're not going to find other seed companies all right i'm tired full. you full? full that was a long show yep anyway hope everybody enjoyed yep. it let us know if you have any questions hit that share button smash that subscribe button if that's something you're into we will see you guys on next and week's get show. out there and get something done it's pretty weather it's time to get out in that garden Bye-bye.